Welcome to the Undivide Project podcast. This is our Change Makers edition where we are talking to women who are making a difference in the climate and social justice spaces. My name is Monica Sanders and I'm your host and I'm so excited to be with Priyanka Surio this afternoon. Priyanka, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I want to get right into it. Everyone has an origin story. So every guest I open with offering the opportunity to telling what your origin story is, whether that's how you came into the space, how you came into yourself, whatever you choose to share with the audience. I offer that to you. Absolutely. So I always start with home where I grew up um, as my igniting spark or passion for social justice. And that has spanned healthcare, it has spanned climate and sustainability, but it comes from that personal story. And so I'm a multicultural woman. My father grew up in South India and immigrated here in the 90s. My mother spent time between two countries. She's Hungarian, Romanian, so she spent time in America and Hungary. Both of them did not have a lot of resources and they were also both very young when they had me. And so we grew up uh, at poverty level or sometimes below. Young parents were in the middle or the center of Florida in Polk County in a small rural town of Mulberry. And that environment that I grew up in was at the intersection of so many things. I already mentioned the financial socioeconomic piece, but also we lived in a food desert. So we did not have access to healthy foods for a very long time until there was finally a grocery store within biking and driving distance. I say biking because that's how most kids got around within the neighborhood. There were a lot of other highways surrounding our neighborhood, so not very walkable. The one park that we had was not the safest. A lot of kids would get injured because the infrastructure wasn't the best. And it's not like anyone was pouring investment or funding into creating greener or safer spaces. So that was like the one space other than going through the forests and, and, and the swamp lands, which are not really set up as green spaces. No. <laughs> Spaces, And so um, we grew up in this area and it was very low health literacy, low financial literacy, and also low educational literacy. Um, when I went to college, I believe I remember seeing a statistic where only about one to two percent of people from my neighborhood, from my wow. small town of Calgary, actually went to college. And that was very starking to me. So I say all that to say that that is where I came from. And over my career, I have looked for ways to kind of have that seat at the table, represent, because I know what it's like to come from those communities and to not have equal access. And so for the companies and the policymakers and the venture funds that want to make a difference in healthcare and in climate and are talking about equity, they need someone who has lived it, um, who understands those needs deeply. And so I've built a career kind of understanding the different lovers and players in this space, whether it be from congressional members to federal agencies when I spent time at the VA, FDA, and CDC, or whether it be at the state and local level, which I really enjoyed because it also kind of connected me back to those community origins, or whether it did you know, include a jump into private sector, working with venture capital firms uh, that funded startup founders and realizing that they didn't fund most founders of color who actually yeah. had through the experience. And then finally ending my tenure at Google as a health equity program manager who also got to work on sustainability issues and realizing that the infrastructure for supporting sustainability isn't as high in America because there's a lack of awareness and a lack of interest in it. So that was another fascinating find in my career. And finally, I am now participating in the Climate Based Fellowship, um, which is an opportunity for me to square climate at, at in more of a direct manner in my career and to intersect health and climate together as I see that intersection very clearly, but I don't think others always do. So I'm excited to explore that further in the fellowship um, and to, I would say, build more of a branding around the books that I have published, um, which are around sustainability, travel and identity. But within them, I've heard two things from audience members. And so I'll quote my audience here. One uh, person mentioned, you have a wellness model for how to navigate the world. And the other mentioned, this is climate justice at its finest. And so um, I really appreciated those two comments. And I think the books themselves, while they, they do focus on the travel space, have opened up a lot more doors for me to intersect climate and health together. Those are all great. And I'm looking forward to unpacking them as we continue to speak. But what was 
within your experiences looking at health, you've been exposed to so much, which is typical of intersectional folks in the United States, dealing with poverty issues and food issues. And whenever those things take place, usually some of the root causes are steeped in public health and education and in what I call divestic communities, because a lot of times the lack of investment or the removal of investment for certain communities to be placed to benefits in others is done by law and policy. It's intentional. Mm -hmm. There is this climate justice intersection. And so I'm interested in whether there was a role or if there was a moment where you said, I want to dig in deeper on this climate justice piece of it. Yes. So I I mentioned all those pieces of my environment uh, and I didn't know that when I was in the environment. I just knew it wasn't great and I knew there had to be something better. And I didn't know that until I actually went to college and I participated in a uh, research uh, fellowship. And this research fellowship, I explored the relationship of the built environment on mental, physical and social health in both immigrant and non-immigrant Hispanic populations in Miami compared to the majority population. And that was so eye-opening. That's when I learned about what a food desert was. That is when I learned about how certain groups were placed in certain areas that were closer to freeways or closer to toxins. Um, That is when I learned about what you just mentioned about divested um, or not being invested enough in communities where you have abandoned buildings or where you have broken windows. And so there is this kind of theory called broken windows theory that when a community is not cleaned up, it doesn't inspire a lot of confidence to be social and to walk and, and to feel safe. And so these communities also felt social isolation because they didn't feel safe because aesthetically it doesn't look that way. It's not clean. It's not cleaned up. Right. right? So that was kind of the pivotal moment for me to understand how place and how your environment affects your health in so many ways. That is um, interesting. I have a, a similar perspective in that coming from these kinds of communities or coming from these backgrounds, often we don't have the language, which is why, as you've pointed out in your career, you keep coming back to communities. Is that the solutions and the identification of issues are in the communities. There's just not the language there to communicate with the majority. And I'm wondering if you found that in your community work and also if there's a particular community where you've worked and maybe solutioned with or ideated with that jumps out at you as being particularly impactful. Plus 100 to the language not being there. And yet the knowledge is, um, whether it's the knowledge of like something's not right and we have to, we know how to address that or Um, We know that something needs to be done to address that. How do we galvanize and come together? And I think sometimes that may be the most intimidating part, but when I have seen it done well, it's a very beautiful moment where the community gets to be empowered and to have ownership over these things. Um, And so a way that I've actually seen it play out uh, in some of my work, and I have one example that I've seen play out in my work and then one that's more organic that I'd like to share. But the one that was in my work, uh, was was funded. It was a effort by a local hospital as well as the public health department. And it was a community organized effort in both Atlanta. There were two pilot projects, one in Atlanta and one in Milwaukee and Wisconsin. And essentially they were leveraging the resources and the knowledge of the public health department to pull together these data visualizations of areas of violence that were happening in their community. And they were leveraging both law enforcement data as well as hospital data to understand like the overlaps and the overlays and then understand like a little bit more deeply, well, what's happening in these areas that that's occurring. And so some of them were able to find, for example, that there was no lighting perhaps in that particular corridor, that there was an illegal a gambling ring happening in another area at the back of a gas station, and that sometimes it would incite certain violent incidences. Um, Others were able to identify like certain human trafficking elements happening. And so it was fascinating that while there's this data that does come from these authoritative figures, the entity responsible for deciding what do we do with that and how do we move forward was the community coalition group. They would see that, they would talk amongst themselves, and they would decide, okay, we want to do something here. We want to advocate for there to be more lighting here. We want to break up this gambling ring. Like, they would be the ones who were the decision makers. That's a funded effort. And again, there could be a lot of um, controversy around who's involved, and I I think I understand that deeply. 
Um, and so a community effort that I've seen that I find that's just much more organic and that um, I even witnessed was in Hawaii. And in Hawaii, you see a lot of the members of the community dealing with a lot of issues around inflation and high prices and not being able to retain and hold on to their land. Yeah. And so there has been this collective, yes, and it's really problematic. And so there has been this collective movement to try to, you know, lean into that in a way where they can retain the land. And so a lot of the native people um, who want to be able to stay there have started banding together to create farms and to create these farms that allow for farm stays and to allow for collaborations with the big corporations that are trying to take over, to get in in a way that makes this more like ecotourism and sustainable tourism to where they have a, a reason for staying there and a reason for operating and a way to bring in money. And it's something that they've always done. They've always been tenders of the land. They've always been um, responsible, uh, you know, responsible for the, for the planet and the earth and having that very direct connection and relationship. But now they've had to pivot and adapt to this changing environment of more tourism coming in, driving a lot of the local people out. And they're like, well, how can we hack that? okay, we'll create farm stays. We'll create these like beautiful like farm experiences where people can see from like coffee bean to coffee um, or macadamia nut to like macadamia butter, how we like do all of these things that have been passed in the ancestors for years and years. And so that is a natural like response that I've seen from the community that was community driven that a lot of local people gathered together to um, try to fight a lot of that, that uh, development that did not help their people. Right. That was both detrimental to the built environment, but also to the culture and to the ownership of it. So that is beautiful because there is a piece of that that's also about reclaiming narratives, creating these beautiful spaces, but also reclaiming the community's narrative, which is, for me, an important part of whether we call it sustainability or social impact or social innovation, whatever label we put on it, is creating the right kinds of infrastructures for these things to take place. You know, when we were preparing to record, you and I were talking about sustainability. And one of the things that you mentioned was that in U.S. business, I would even say in U.S. policy, the infrastructure to support true sustainability work really isn't there. I agree with that. Um, and it's, it's not there both from, I would say, the appropriate investment. And I've been learning a lot about this in the Climate Based Fellowship where the investments are after a lot of the trendy and tech related things instead of what's actually needed for the environment. And then secondly, there's just not as much interest or prioritization of these things within our businesses either as compared to other regions of the world um, like Europe, Middle East, Africa, and APAC, so Asian Pacific um, area regions. And it's pretty glaring in even just my like very limited experience working in corporate sustainability when I was at Google, um, we got to take on a passion project if we wanted to. And I knew even though I was working in health equity, I continue wanting to be at the intersection of these different areas. And so I pitched my book, actually the research I'd done with my book and the knowledge I had gained as a way to speak with these different sustainability groups at Google. And I ended up being able to work for the Google cloud team and they have a global team that works in sustainability and they were really happy that someone joined from America because they didn't have any representation from anyone in America at that time, which wow. I thought was starting. Yes, they they had representation from other people. And sure, they have employees that are in America, but to have a representative who would be organizing the community, because a lot of the work I did was organizing our global community of like 670 people, gathering um, content for our monthly newsletters and for our presentations to demonstrate customer wins and partner wins. And they just didn't have someone from America who was who was involved. Um, hopefully I've changed that because I did spread the word about what I did with others um, across the organization. And I tried to recruit a couple of other volunteers. I never think that you should do this work alone. And so um, hopefully and now that I've left, that work will continue in terms of America's representation. But absolutely. I mean, I don't know if it was a lack of interest, a lack of awareness, what it was, but uh, yeah, it was striking to me that we were not at that table. I am equally stunned listening to you tell that story, stunned at the lack of representation, but also at your success in bringing this forward. So there's, you know, a two pronged reaction to that. And I do wonder if 
oftentimes sustainability and DEI and environmental work are put under the package of corporate social responsibility, which is often understaffed and underinvested in within corporations in addition to externally being underinvested in. And I wonder if that is at play sometimes when we're dealing with private industry, that it's sort of marginalized in a different way of using the term or, or bracketed off as being more of a special interest as opposed to something that is in the top line of the profit margins and other interests of the organization. I'm just, just a thought as I'm listening to you, to you talk about this, if that is some of the, the issue or if it just may be lack of awareness. I don't know. One thing I'll add to that is I, the people that I work with care about this. They care about this issue. They're very passionate. I can tell that they're genuine and good people. And so I think that there's sometimes a difference between the people and the actual company or corporation. And I, do, I did want to make that distinction because um, the people that I worked with, were they cut it straight with me. They're like, you know, I care about this work, but at the end of the day, our company cares about profits. And we will have to demonstrate some kind of profitability that because we had sustainability within our cloud technology or we showed a sustainability use case, we got more customers or we got higher paying customers. And that is the jarring and ugly truth of it sometimes. And but the thing is, sustainability can be cost effective. It can be a wise investment. It was just interesting that that was the first focus in the priority. Like we have to make profits and then. Sure, sustainability is just nice to have, but everyone who was working in that space really cared about it, and they also sometimes felt that tension or that um, that dissonance, if you will, of like, wow, but I'm having to make this profit for this company, and it just doesn't feel great, but I do care about this work, and maybe this is better than if it was nothing at all. That is an important distinction to make, and also within that, some important considerations for people who are working in different areas of sustainability about when you're approaching corporations or how you navigate those relationships is understanding that that tension is there sometimes um, and may manifest itself in different ways. You brought up your book. We talked about your book a couple of times. I want to, I'm glad to know that it emanated from that work, but I do want to talk about your personal reasons for the book and also, what are some of the things that you want us, the collective, to take from what you've written? Yeah, so the collective, if you want to learn more about the book, you can definitely find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. It's in a couple of bookstores. I think my top grossing bookstore is at Barnes & Noble in the Grove, a physical location, but you can also find it online, Apple Books, all that. Um, so definitely pick up a copy if you want to learn more or dig in more. But I have two personal reasons, and they're very simple. And then I would say the book and how it's come to be in its final form. And I'm working on a second one now that extends on that. But it just kind of grew. It expanded beyond even my own wildest dreams. But the first personal reason is I've always wanted to be a writer. Um, one of the first things I wanted to be when I grew up, when I was the, the little age of four, uh, was to be an author, was to be a writer. And I remember writing my first book at that age. Um, and there were definitely some spelling errors. I had some drawings. Well, in the yes, it's, and it, it was a, it was a very special, um, book about connecting with your ancestors and connecting with those who have passed. Uh, I don't know how I had that insight and wisdom at four, but I still have that with me. And it's kind of my daily reminder of that childhood dream that I had and not letting the inner child die. And when I was finally able to publish this book, it really kind of unlocked almost this world of possibility for me. And um, and not that things are impossible, but throughout my career, and I'm sure we'll get into this, I've often felt that they were, or that I have, there has been a blocker or that glass ceiling or barriers to me actually achieving what I want to achieve. So publishing the book was almost like a way to like break that glass. Uh, it was a great feeling. So that was the first reason. The second one and why it's about travel um, I was an avid traveler. I still am. Um, I've been to about 60 countries and almost all 50 states. I have two left. Um, and so that's all well and good. And I've been able to connect culturally to other peoples and learn about their way of life from an authentic and genuine place. 
but I do still feel guilty about that carbon footprint. And so I really wanted to explore, well, what can a traveler do to be more mindful, to be more responsible? I do care about the climate and I want to explore that more. And so this was a way to bring about my passion and almost self-check me, but also provide an avenue forward for how I could be sustainable, how I, how I could be leaving more positive footprints behind the negative footprints. And I think that was that it was kind of the bit of that guilt along with that curiosity for understanding whether that could even be done uh, as to why I focused on sustainability and travel. That is, you know, yesterday, or we're recording this in, in March for the audience and then putting it in the context of the date they were recording it, it was the day before that KLM Airlines lost a suit for was essentially greenwashing, but actually leading their passengers and potential customers into believing that their carbon footprint, that their travel opportunities, at least through that particular industry, did not take as much of a toll on the earth as was happening in actuality. And so that is, you know, top of mind for a lot of people. But, you know, one other thing that came out in our conversation, and I want to talk about this in the book, and then we'll transition to career um, issues, is representation in, tr in the travel industry. And it's important to see yourself, to know that you can do something, or to see someone to whom you can relate, to know that you can do something. And it's great that in the last couple of years, the idea of traveling and connecting to cultures and doing so in a responsible way has gotten more attention. But I do think that there's still a lot of work to be done there. And so there's an aspect of your book that is about representation, but also about doing so, not just thinking about carbon footprints, but thinking about cultural impact as well. Thank you for bringing that up. And I think you know, instead of that being a personal reason, it's more of like an external reason as to why I wrote the book. Um, I did write the book for others. I wrote the book for the people back in Mulberry who don't think it's possible, who don't see themselves represented in the travel industry, who don't see themselves traveling. And um, the way that I did this is, sure, the book talks about my experience as a woman of color traveling, but I also interviewed a lot of other travelers of color, travelers who had disabilities, um, you know, travelers who were solo female travelers. I focused on the people who were underrepresented largely um, in this space. And I really wanted to center on their experiences traveling. Um, because what I've often found when you do see what's advertised, when you do hear people talk about this, and they're predominantly not people of color, people who are facing disability or who are part of the LGBTQI plus community, I mean, it's so easy for them. Anything can happen. And I would say it's just not really the same when you are from one of these historically marginalized or yeah. underrepresented groups. Um, and I really wanted to shed light on both the experience, the raw experience that happens, but also the ways in which we've been creative and intuitive to navigate those circles. And I think like one story that I just want to highlight here to give you a flavor of what's in there is there was a friend of mine, his name is Daquan Bruce. He's an African-American male from Southside Chicago. Never really imagined that he'd be in tra he would be traveling. But then when he did, it was a beautiful experience. And he's in Senegal, um, you know, kind of connecting with the locals. And he doesn't really know much. And this is his first time in West Africa. And he said this line that just still echoes with me. He's like, I had to be comfortable being the fool in the room. I was okay laughing at myself and laughing with these other people. And as soon as they saw that I was comfortable, it broke down a lot of barriers and then we could become friends from that. And I loved that he was, he felt comfortable enough to do that. He felt safe enough to do that. And he was able to have a beautiful experience as a result of that. And I don't know that too many travelers who do come from privileged backgrounds or from the majority say, I'm going to be the fool and I'm just going to not know and I'll be comfortable with that. I doubt that there's as much comfort in that. But I think when you grow up with so much adversity and you have to be more creative, um, you do get comfortable navigating certain spaces and kind of playing them to your advantage. That is a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing that. And when you said that, it reminded me of a conversation I recently with my partner discovered in sort of a Columbus way, it's always been there on Peacock, um, that there was this show that was on for three seasons called Soul. And it's these dialogues between pivotal, pivotal African-Americans. So we're watching James Baldwin and Maya Angelou have a conversation in a variety show. 
that I had no idea was on NBC for years. But they were talking about the African and African-American tradition of laughing through adversity. And so there is a, a backstory or cultural history of being the fool as a way of offsetting trauma. And I'm not sure if you realize it in that moment, but you're recounting that story. So it's like, yes, because in certain communities, joking, laughing, fooling around is a way of processing adversity. And that's not always present in majority communities. The reflex to do that or to be able to engage in that way isn't always present. And so acknowledging that the experiences will be different based on cultural context and cultural backgrounds um, is an important thing to bring up and to surface those stories is a really wonderful thing. So I'm glad that you were able to do that and that we're doing this in a book. As a side note to the audience, we will put all of this in the show notes. So you'll be able to click through and find these resources and be able to locate this book that we're talking about so much. When we're talking about representation, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, because we're talking about women change makers, and that's intentional, because one of the things that I said when we put out the call was I want the people who are doing the work that maybe can't afford a publicist or don't even know that they can access a publicist to help them promote their work, or maybe because of structural issues, it isn't highlighted, or the people that they work with aren't highlighted, or are just challenged in how to do it. And... I wanted to talk about majority dominated spaces and some of the challenges you've had in navigating them and also some of the ways that I'm going to make a guess here that you've made space for yourself or found your way into new spaces as a way of doing your work. Yes. I mean, I am someone, you know, being able to come from where I come from and then, you know, navigate so many different countries and spaces like I now will like fight to be at that table. I will knock on that door. Um, but I still have to do that. Uh, and I think that's the thing is like, sometimes it can be exhausting. And um, yeah. within my career, there have been moments where I have faced that glass ceiling, whether it was that I wasn't going to be able to progress further structurally or systemically, because that's just how the company was wired or because certain people were, um, kind of blockers to me uh, and or would be promoted over me. And I experienced this with both white men and white women. And you would, yeah, I know we're talking about women change makers and you would think that, you know, as women, we would come together, but sometimes it's been women who were like some of my biggest dementors, if you will, in the workplace of creating a really kind of toxic environment and micromanaging even if they did not have managerial oversight over me and, yeah. um, you know, really creating this kind of environment where it was hard to work with them and where they felt in competition with me and they would always want to steal that spotlight. And unfortunately, in many of those instances, you have leadership who are white males who are kind of having their ear bent towards the, the white woman. And so it was just an, unfortunate that I had experienced that. And in so many of those instances, while I had, you know, educated my way in. I had talked my way in. I had learned the things to be there. Um, it was that environment that uh, caused me to plan my exit. And anytime I will run into those barriers or those ceilings, I'm like, okay, my work here is done. I want to be able to, I want to expand. I want to do more. And if I can't do that here, I'm wasting my time. And I need to be in a space that lets me grow, that lets me have impact. I'm not here for the name brands. I'm not here for the paycheck, although that helps. But I would like to be able to do that in a place that's going to adequately let me move. And so um, that's when, yeah, that's when I'll start planning my exit. And I, I wish I could say that you can last more than, you know, four or five years. But that's kind of been the max that I've seen before you start getting those barriers. And I say that because there was even a position where I did achieve like a senior leadership level. I had to fight for that, by the way, like every year with each new um, boss that I would have because I changed bosses or there would be restructurings or whatever the case might be. But I always had to advocate. But I had this long presentation of documented achievements and impact that I just kind of kept with me that I was like, hey, look at all this impact. Look at all this work. You know, why can't we take it to the next level? And then finally, they, there was nothing they could say where no would be an appropriate answer. Yes, I'm shaking my head at the familiarity 
of all of that. And I'm glad that you called out that we're talking about women change makers, but the the bond between women and the sisterhood isn't always the same. And it isn't expressed in the ways that it's presented sometimes. I like the term that you use, dementors, because, um, you know, there's this women's movement or we talk about gendered issues. But one of the problems within that is that the default woman oftentimes is a white woman and doesn't take into account people of color, people with different abilities, people who come from different backgrounds or who don't come from the right school or the correct pedigree are still often excluded from that conversation or challenged in their work. But I do appreciate you just saying, you know, there is a, a point in which you've done all that you can do. It's unfortunate, but that is the reality. And I do think that people listening to this podcast, particularly the people who are coming behind us as we're in this conversation, need to know that, but also that there's power and peace in walking away and going into spaces that are healthy and creative and are willing to amplify certain work or even to create your own as you've done some of. And I'm curious if that's also some of your, your planning as you go forward. Yes. Um, you know, I there's so much energy I spent early on in my life just fighting and advocating and and I say fighting and you know not in the literal sense but like using all the tools at my disposal to try to arm myself to be the best to be the most educated you're working twice as hard three times as hard right and I think it gets exhausting and um I think a lot of people probably experienced you know some kind of form of burnout or identity change or disassociation during the pandemic which was a time when a lot of things grinded to a halt which was a time of a great loss which was also a time of great global protest against um, violence and the killing of black lives from law enforcement and i think that it just we kind of got to this point where like i am tired and enough is enough and i started seeing this shift and i don't know if everyone's caught on to it but I started seeing this shift where there started being these safer spaces and these more community oriented spaces where you were around like minded people, where you could be psychologically safe, where you could grow, where you could actually share your the, the times when you felt frustrated and angry and upset and, um, you know, humiliated. And then once you could address that and heal then came the great opportunities of collaborating and of self-promotion or collaborative promotion. And I started seeing those spaces as the ones I wanted to continue being in and the ones I will continue being in. And for so many people that think like, oh, it's hopeless or, you know, what what is actually happening in the world? There are safe spaces being created everywhere. Um, and you just kind of have to find them and tap into them. And uh, I have found a lot of those spaces in a lot of different communities. So not just even my own of, of being a South Indian woman and, and tapping into a group of South Indian women who are very encouraging, but I'm also part of another group that's of people across the African diaspora and their allies. And they talk a lot about the right kinds of investment in Africa and bridging the gap between African-Americans and Africans. And it's exciting to be invited to that and to be part of it in the right and genuine ways. And it's also allowed me to identify when that's not happening very clearly. Um, and, and I appreciate that. And so there are those spaces. And I will say that as I continue to grow and, and chart my own path, it's always going to be centered on the community. I definitely have taken the book in ways that I didn't even imagine. And some of those have been speaking engagements um, to, to large corporations, to the travel industry. And honestly, my personal favorite is schools. Um, I don't know why this it, it emerged in this way, because my books are not for younger audiences. They're for adult audiences. Um, but for whatever reason, schools have really tapped onto the fact that I am this author. I have traveled. I've done this work. And so I've been collaborating with a lot of different schools. Some are in South Central L.A. Um, some are in Texas, um, you know, just kind of really anywhere and really speaking to that youth about what is possible, about being a young writer. Um, about traveling and breaking some of those barriers and that you can do this. And that's some of my favorite work. I think that's amazing. And, you know, sometimes we just, one of my mentors always says, wherever you are is where you're supposed to be. I love that. <laughs> And, and sometimes you don't always feel that way until you reflect on it afterwards. But um, because I've spent time in so many spaces, it's actually equipped me with a lot of just intimate knowledge about 
um, especially in the US, I have a lot of intimate knowledge about a lot of our states. Like I understand kind of deeply the American experience from a different facets of it as well. Um, and I agree, like sometimes I don't see that, like why am I here or should I be somewhere else? I could be anywhere else. I've been kind of living and orienting my life in that way. But every time I am in a place, I know, and the people I meet and the collaborations that happen that I didn't, sometimes I didn't even plan for these. Right. I was like, okay, yes, I was supposed to be here. We are, the beautiful thing about these conversations, they're so rich, but they go quickly. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Let's talk about young people because we are, you know, you've just transitioned from being in schools where you didn't think you would be. What's some of the advice that you would give to the young women, people who identify as women and other who are coming behind you in this work? What are some words of advice or encouragement that you would offer to them? Definitely find your safe spaces and uh, the community and the people who are going to make room for you to fail and to experiment and to try without judging you, without trying to push you in any one direction. They're just going to kind of allow you to be and to grow and to leverage your curiosity. And I say this first because the biggest piece of advice I can give you that worked for me at least was to just try. I experimented with a lot of things. I spoke with a lot of people. I put myself in a lot of spaces and I had to keep doing that and get over that hurdle of failure and rejection so that I could move forward. And there is another side to it. Um, it might not be the side you were imagining. It may be some other different avenue or path. And you're like, actually, I like this one better than the one I thought or the one I had planned. But you need those safe spaces because otherwise you can get really discouraged and you can feel like it's hopeless and it's pointless. And why am I even trying? So the safe spaces will be your cheerleaders, your pep squad, your pep rally on a hard day. And it will allow you to keep making those mistakes, which you need to learn to make impact, to become who you're going to become. Thank you. That is wonderful. Thank you for that. And I think many people in our audience will be able to take something from that. So I appreciate you offering that. So now we know we can find your book on Amazon and Barnes and Nobles. Where can our audience follow you and keep up with your work? Yes. So I will share my uh, website. It's a link tree. It has a couple of links um, to podcasts and things like that. And I hope to add this one to that repertoire as well. Um, but also on social media, I am at PS Travel Stories. So P-S-T-R-A-V-E-L-S-T-O-R-I-E-S. -E um, and that's on most uh, social media platforms, though I'm most active on Instagram and then also on LinkedIn, uh, which I highly encourage young people to get into. It's, a, it's kind of your professional networking, and you can just find that by my name, Priyanka Surio. Thank you so much. And... To learn more about the Undivide Project and stay updated on our work and the wonderful people with whom we collaborate, you can follow us on all channels at Undivide Project or go to our website, undivideproject.org. Thank you so much, Priyanka, for joining us. Thank you to our audience for your wonderful attention. And stay tuned. We have so many wonderful women change makers that we're going to be speaking to that cut across the climate justice, sustainability, as well as the creative community on the Undivide Project podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you.